you know, it was a sort of spiritual practice place in the 50s and 60s. And it was, a, it was a, taught by a, a guide who is some sort of supernatural entity, or rather supernormal entity from another dimension, who was channeled by a woman named Eva Paracas, a um, Austrian woman married to an Argentinian man. And uh, the, everyone, and it had a huge following actually, we've had a few reunions, have they had one since you've been here Jonathan? I think we used to have a few reunions and hundreds of people came. People mentioned it, but... Yeah, so that we, well we had, and uh, when we, we've been here now uh, 14 years, and um, hundreds of people came and they had breakthrough experiences when they were young and so on, and I think the guide and Eva Paracas wrote 55 books totally that had been published about sort of discovering yourself and so forth. So it had a kind of spiritual focus and, um, and a community and they had another center, it expanded, had a center in Virginia that they still have and they had a center in Europe, which I don't know if they still have or not. So they had that history and then uh, the reason that we were given this property, which Tibet House was given without uh, totally lock, stock and barrel for free, uh, was because uh, when the Dalai Lama asked us to, um, asked me actually, and Nina, to take care of the mission of Tibet House U.S., to preserve the Tibetan culture and to create a foundation in America that would support the Tibetan culture in the time when the Chinese are committing ethnocide, which they are doing in Tibet, they are trying to destroy the Tibetan identity as a separate identity from Chinese because they don't want someone in the future generation reclaiming the land, <laughs> which is a huge land. It is one third of the physical surface of China. And it was very empty, it only had six million people in it because the mass Chinese couldn't go there because it's average altitude of almost three miles, 14,000 feet. And you have to have special physiology to live there without, you know, women miscarry at that altitude who are, you grew up at sea level and men get heart disease when they try to stay there all year round. And uh, that's why Chinese never colonized it or occupied it before. They didn't live there at all until 1950. So they're, they're, they, they have, there's nothing personal they don't have about Tibetans, but it's just that the government of China wants to claim that they always owned Tibet which they didn't, and so to do that they have to change the culture from being a Tibetan culture to being some form of Chinese culture. And so in that period of ethnocide, the Dalai Lama asked me in 1979 when he first visited America to me and some other people to create a Tibet House U.S. that would be a big foundation that in the future could help restore and preserve and promote Tibetan culture, right? That's what it was about. And uh, for the first few years, from 1986, well, we didn't do much from 1979 to 86 because I was in Massachusetts. And um, I was working with the Tibetan guy in New York and we didn't get very much done. And we didn't have a place or anything. And then in 86, 87, Richard Gere joined us. And uh, we got, we worked hard, he worked hard with us for about five years till 91. And then he went off to join the political, the Tibetan political organization, which was always his bent. He likes to testify in Congress and protest and make movies about the injustice. And that's his sort of, you know, his culture, he thinks it's something for the old ladies in the museums or something. You know, he's not really into it. So he kind of said, well, that's all I can do it five years later. And so there was no one left to lead Tibet House. So before that, I had created the content, you know, the exhibitions, the sort of writings and so on, but I was not administratively in charge. And when the Dalai Lama then asked me when Gear went to the political thing to take charge and to do it, I was very unhappy. And what I saw was that the most important element of Tibetan culture that will really attract great support for it in, uh, throughout in history, in a way, is the medicine tradition. Because Tibetan medicine was very, very, Buddhist medicine in India was very famous to start with, very constitutive of Ayurvedic Hindu medicine, <coughs> and very important during the year, during the 1500 years of Buddhist monastic, uh, per, you know, pervasion of India. And uh, then when that was destroyed by the Islamic invasions there, uh, it moved to Tibet. 
And it was a big deal in China and Korea and Japan as well. Wherever Buddhism was, the medicine was almost a big thing because it, you know, it helped people's health, you know. And uh, I had studied that when I was a Buddhist monk in the 60s, but never really practiced it, but I knew what it was, you know. So I had this dream that the way to preserve Tibetan culture was to make Tibetan medical knowledge and insight available to modern people, you know, Westerners, Americans, Europeans, whatever, Japanese, doesn't matter. And um, so I went around always since 92 saying, you know, to different people, we almost had a place in Santa Fe at one time, which would have been impossible to manage from New York, but someone almost gave us a place. I was saying we need a place to create a spa because Tibetan medicine is not a legal <coughs> tradition in America, so it's not like acupuncture, it's not licensed here yet. So you can't start a hospital or a clinic, but you can make a spa, you know, and use the knowledge of external things that are not strictly medical to uh, introduce it to the public. So um, finally, there's some lady heard about it who had this place, which she'd been preparing for the Greek medical tradition. That's why that place is called Delos. And they had something called the Asclepius Foundation, which was the Greek god of medicine. It was the Greek Menla, you know. Menla is the Buddha of medicine, so Asclepius was the Greek god of medicine. But uh, the group that was going to make a Greek healing, Greek alternative medical thing here, or spa sort of place, um, they kind of had personality problems. And so they overspent the budget, and so the wealthy lady got tired of them and decided to pull the plug after a few years. They had bought it from the Center for the Living Force, and um, who went bankrupt after they took a loan to build this building, actually. You mean the Pathworks? Uh, and, uh, Nico? And uh, so then she bought it, and then they, they, they couldn't manage it, so then she wanted to give it away. And um, Miko. that's my commentator. <laughs> Miko. <laughs> and, uh, just let him out to run around or something. He's hyperactive because the, uh, one of the dogs is almost in heat. So, um, the female dogs. And so, um, so anyway, the, she called up one day on my 60th birthday and uh, said, uh, do you want the Pathwork Center? 25 minutes from where we live in Woodstock. So I said no, <laughs> because that morning Nina had, said, had, had woken up her before me, because I was just back from Tibet on a jet lag. She'd had a dream that we were working our butts off during our 60s. This was just before my 60th birthday. And uh, for nothing, we're not paid by Tibet House. It's a volunteer work for us, in, either in New York or here. And um, so, uh, uh, she said, I had the dream we were working on some big project and you were hammering on a roof, shouting at an architect, and worst of all, not listening to me. <laughs> so if anybody proposes a big project to you, say no. So I said to this very rich hedge fund lady, I said, I have to say no, because my wife just had a, like a you know, precognition that something like this might happen and told me to say no. Well, let me ask her again. <laughs> so then I asked her on that while the lady was on the phone, and she said, oh, and then I cursed a little bit and said, oh, <laughs> hell, I can't say no because it will be an asset of the Tibetan people. And, they, you know, I can't turn it down for them, you know, and I'll just have to work for nothing forever type thing. So she, she said that. So I said that to the lady, and that must have, must, the lady must have liked that I was list, trying to listen to my wife. And so, then we made an appointment in New York for a few days later, and I, I, know I didn't take it that seriously, because many people in the 50 years I've been dealing with Tibet, or 50 plus years, many people come and say, oh, I want to really help Tibet, you know, and then they don't do anything, you know, so it happens, you know. So I wasn't taking it seriously, but, but uh, Nina said, oh yeah, well, now we're going to have to do that, and um, she knew right away. And then the lady who introduced us to that rich lady, called me up and said, what happened in that conversation? I said, it was, we just made an appointment, nothing happened, you know, but maybe we can have the place to make our spa there. And uh, she said, well, no, the lady is saying she doesn't want to hear any other proposals, that she's giving it to you and the Dalai Lama. So I said, well, that's a surprise to me, she didn't tell me that, you know, but that she was telling the other people on the board of that Asclepius Foundation. You know. 
So, um, so anyway, that's what happened. And uh, so we've been struggling to put it together and um, we've been renting to yoga groups and things like that to, you know, cover the bottom line the way you've seen us do, and to other groups, Hasidic groups, feng shui, uh, you know, Jewish Hasidic groups, etc., whatever. But our ultimate aim is to make it a really flourishing Tibetan medicine oriented, but using other Western modalities and herbal modalities, Native American modalities, whatever it might, Ayurveda, acupuncture, whatever it is, alternative things, uh, to help people's health and also the mental things of Buddhist meditation, and mindfulness, you know, like the mindfulness craze and things like that, you know, the, to teach that here in connection with health, you know. So that's the thing. So, so that's what we're doing. And um, that's why Nina and I work on it, although we're not paid to work on it. And um, so uh, in that light, uh, I, we, we think it's important that people who work here have an idea. It doesn't mean everybody has to be a Tibetan Buddhist by any means. But it just means that they have an idea of like what, what the, the atmosphere of the place should be for the people who come. And in order for the atmosphere to be a certain way for the people who come, then it would be good if the people working ideally had a kind of motivation like that. It isn't that, um, you know, as I said, it's not a matter of people have to subscribe. And actually the perfect thing which I'm teaching a course on that is online also in uh, New York this spring at Tibet House, um, based on this book called A Force for Good. And uh, Justin, did you order the book? Yep. We're going to have right. copies here so you can read this. And what this is, it's called The Dalai Lama's Vision for Our World. And it, it, the Dalai Lama makes a big fuss when he gives a talk in America to people who are not in a Dharma center, you know, Buddhist center. And he says, whatever I'm talking about, I want you all to know, I don't want to make you into Buddhists. I'm not here to recruit Buddhists. He makes a big stink about it. And uh, he really means it. And he says, the reason is that it's, uh, that it's important to, to, in a case of a religion, it's important for people to keep whatever they have had as a child. And also your family will be upset if your grandmother was Jewish or Christian or Muslim, and you become a Buddhist, then she'll freak out. And I don't want to be freaking out the grandmothers, he said. And, or if you're a secularist, then that's what you are. And, but in Buddhism, we have, in the Buddhist um, science tradition about the mind science, we have a lot of knowledge about psychology, about negative emotions and positive emotions, about how to handle the ego and how to lessen its, its hold over you and so on. And these are not religious things. These are things that can be used in the context of every religion because all of them basically are seeking to get, make people, to help people become more compassionate, more wise, more kind and this kind of thing. So that he always gives that speech and, and what results from that over the years are these different initiatives that he has done where he tries to get compassion training for people in, in different religious traditions and in schools. Mindfulness, he's been a part of what has become now basically in corporate America, a kind of mindfulness craze, you know, where everybody in the Aetna insurance company sits down and has 20 minutes of mindfulness every day and this kind of thing in order to be less unhappy in the work and to be more productive and, and less more cooperative with each other, more harmonious in the company, less competitive and so forth. Uh, although, you know, there are a lot of cynical people who are not that crazy about it. They think it's kind of only, it's not really the real thing. So, um, but it's, a, it's an important thing. So this, this I think is really nice because it kind of shows, it shows what, uh, uh, what, what it's all about, you know. And so, it, so, so there, therefore, yeah, then the other day when we had Isa contacting the guide, which was an amazing event, uh, and then one of the things she said when we asked about um, Menlon was that it was important that everybody here have their own process of education, so to speak, uh, about, you know, their motivation and what the sort of overall motive of the place is, so that people are kind of on the same page about that. Um, 
And so then we then that finally got us off our duff about actually holding this meeting, which we should have done a long time ago. So I thought I would read from this about what is meant by this force for good that the Dalai Lama talks about, because Dan Goleman, this book, he, it's not just Dan Goleman's book, he, he interviewed the Dalai Lama um, it, it, you know, quite a lot, and the book is full of quotes from him, but they are all in the context of the Dalai Lama trying to help people without imposing Buddhism on them, you know, which is what we do here, what we try to do here, you know. I mean, we do have Buddhist events here, but it's not exclusively that at all, you know. So, I'm just going to read and comment as I go in the reading. And it's, this is at the very beginning, called Reinvent the Future. And he starts with a little vignette about His Holiness. The, the British Broadcasting Corporation transmits its world news report globally, the shortwave signals reaching even the remote Himalayan hill district of Dharamsala, that's where Dalai Lama lives, and its ridge-hugging town, McLeod Ganj, where Tenzin Gatso, with 14 Dalai Lama, lived. Therefore, Dalai Lama liked this place when he was here. Were you here already then, Jonathan? No, 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 you were here. Nobody he slept here. in Snow Lion, which we fixed up when you were here, Nina. You were no, you weren't. And, uh, my, my cottage, she called it. He, um, <laughs> he had it all dressed up for her. Right. And he, um, he said he had the best sleep he ever had in North America. And that was 2006, so he'd been coming here since 1979. So that's a lot of sleeps. <laughs> but not, you know, for a few weeks at a time. But he also had a big bowl of milk outside his room. Big one, huge. We had bought gallons of milk thinking that his people would be drinking tea. He doesn't drink tea or coffee himself. It's hot water. But we thought they would be making tea, but he put a big bowl of it. I said, what's the milk for? He said, that's for the Naga, the sort of dragon who lives here, he said. And he said, there's really a big Naga up there. He pointed up toward the mountain. And I said, well, I hope it didn't disturb your sleep, your horns. He said, no, no, I best sleep in North America. It's a friendly Naga. And then he told me to do a certain puja now and then for the Naga, which we try to do. He numbers among the BBC's most devoted listeners, having started in his youth back in Tibet. He sets great store in its reliability as a news source, tuning in whenever he's home at 5.30 a.m., about the time he has breakfast. He gets up at 3, 3.30 every morning to do his morning prayer to Dalam. And he says, I remember once, I've never been up with him at that time, but uh, he said, uh, there was one uh, CNN reporter once was photographing him at 3 in the morning when he first got up, and at one point the guy said to him, what are you doing now, Your Holiness? And you just hear the voice from behind the camera. So then the Dalai looks up and he says, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then the guy says, yeah, well, I'm, no, I'm sorry to be disturbing, but, but now what are you doing normally now? And so the Dalai Lama said, I'm shaping my motivation, he said. Today I'm going to meet a lot of people, I'm going to go in some classes, I'm going to give some teaching. I want to make sure that I am motivated by compassion at all times. So I'm considering compassion to try to intensify it, to shape that motivation for the day, he said. I thought that was kind of cute. And, and that's a Dalai Lama do that after like a lifetime of, that was, you know, of, of uh, practicing these things. Every day I listen to BBC, the Dalai Lama told me, and I hear news of killing, corruption, abuse, and mad people. The BBC's daily litany of human injustices and suffering has led him to the insight that most tragedies are the result of a single deficiency, a lack of compassionate moral responsibility. Our morals should tell us our obligations to others, he says, as opposed to what we want for ourselves. Reflect for a moment on any morning's news as a barometer of humanity's lack of that moral rudder. The reports flow as a sea of negativity that washes over us. Children bombed in their homes, governments brutally suppressing dissent, the devastation of yet another corner of nature. There are bloody executions, invasions, hells on earth, slave labor, countless refugees, even the working poor unable to feed and house themselves. 
the litany of human failings seems endless. There's a curious sense of deja vu about all this. Today's news echoes last year's, last decade's, last centuries. These tales of woe and tragedy are but current tellings of very old stories, the latest missteps in the march of history. While we can also take pride in the progress made during that long march, we can only be troubled by the persistence of destruction and injustice, corruption and grinding inequality. Where are the counter forces that can build the world we want? That's what the Dalai Lama calls us to create. His unique perspective gives him a clear sense of where the human family goes wrong and what we can do to get on track to a better story, one that no longer incessantly repeats the tragedies of the past, but faces the challenges of our time with the inner resources to alter the narrative. He envisions a much needed antidote, a force for good. More than anyone I've ever known, the Dalai Lama embodies and speaks for that better force. This is Dan Goldman talking. We first met in the 1980s, and over the decades I've seen him in action dozens of times, always expressing some aspect of this message. And for this book, he has spent hours detailing the force for good he envisions. That force begins by countering the energies within the human mind that drive our negativity. <clears throat> to change the future from a sorry retread of the past, the Dalai Lama tells us we need to transform our own minds, weaken the pull of our destructive emotions, and so strengthen our better natures. So the Dalai Lama considers that, um, I mean, and this of course is a Buddhist thing, but it's a general thing too, you know. Destructive emotions are like hatred, anger, greed, jealousy, pride, um, you know, fanatical conviction, uh, this type of thing. You know, they have a long list of them. They have some six major ones and they 108 minor ones or 53 minor ones. And there are different lists in different areas of Buddhist psychology. <laughs> and so, so this is like the Dalai Lama's big slogan, you know, world peace through inner peace. So in a way, the force for good here at Menla for us is peace at Menla through each of our inner peace. So the idea being that each of us should be working with whatever tradition we are partial toward. You know, it could be Sufism, could be just uh, personal, our own personal integrity, it could be Christianity, it could be Islam, it could be Judaism, it could be whatever it is, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism. But some sort of thing of where each person is trying to work with themselves while working outside, you know, in other words, and looking in themselves for the causes of harmony amongst others, you know, that this is kind of the thing. As Goldman says, then back to Goldman, without that inner shift, we stay vulnerable to knee-jerk reactions like rage, frustration, and hopelessness. These only lead us down the same old forlorn paths. But with this positive inner shift, we can more naturally embody a concern for others and so act with compassion, the core of moral responsibility. This, the Dalai Lama says, prepares us to enact a larger mission with a new clarity, calm, and caring. We can tackle intractable problems like corrupt decision makers and tuned out elites, greed and self-interest as guiding motives, the indifference of the powerful to the powerless. By beginning this social revolution with inside our own minds, the Dalai Lama's vision aims to avoid the blind alleys of past movements for the better. Think, for instance, of the message of George Orwell's cautionary parable, Animal Farm, how greed and lust for power corrupted the utopias, which were supposed to overthrow despots and help everyone equally, but in the end recreated the power imbalances and injustices of the very past they were supposed to have eradicated. If you know that story, there's actually a movie about it, I think, cartoon. The Dalai Lama sees our dilemmas through the lens of interdependence. As Martin Luther King Jr. put it, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Since we are all enmeshed in the problems, some of the needed solutions are within our reach. And so each one of us potentially numbers in this force for good. We can begin now, he tells us, to move in the right direction to any degree we can and in whatever ways are available to us. 
All of us together can create a movement, a more visible force in history that shapes the future to break free of the chains of the past. The seeds we plant today, he sees, that the Dalai Lama sees, can change the course of our shared tomorrow. Some may bring immediate fruits, others may only be harvested by generations yet to come. But our united efforts, if based on this inner shift, can make an enormous difference. The life journey that led the Dalai Lama to this vision has followed a complex course, but we can pick up the final trajectory to this book from the moment he attained a sustained global spotlight. So then, and then Dan goes on to talk about when he won the Nobel Peace Prize and so on. So I just thought that I think that particular beginning passage is very, very good because, and it's good for us in this context, you know, for this brief talk that I'm starting what I hope to be hold a regular group of, uh, court of, uh, of uh, classes for us, just ourselves, not for the clients, you know, for the, for the people coming from outside. In a way, people come from outside to Menla because they are sort of looking in different ways for some kind of a force for good, you know. We're not a regular corporation that just can advertise, like, come and have a weekend at a hotel. They have to be coming to do some sort of spiritual work or re recuperation or mindfulness practice or something to kind of join up the movement, the secular, the sort of non-denominational general movement of a force for good, you know, for social change. And people, uh, you know, we have popular word of mouth uh, popularity, actually, Menla does, with people because they always feel better when they come and they feel happy, uh, you know, happier when they leave than when they arrive, usually. Now and then you have the occasional grumpy person who somehow feels disappointed, but very rarely, actually. Usually, you know, Sharon Salford always tells the funny story about the guy who came on a re meditation retreat to Barry, to their meditation center there, uh, which is overtly Buddhist in that case. But anyway, he came there, he meditated for, supposed to be five-day retreat or something, I think, stayed for two or three days. And then he left angrily and was walking down the road saying, it didn't work. It didn't work. <laughs> Meaning his own meditation didn't work, but he was thinking about it some other thing, you know, not himself. You know. So we get a little of that. But mainly that's what we're supposed to do. So it's not fair and it's not nice that those who are working here and who are all contributing to the delivery of this better feeling to the people are not themselves sort of learning some of the things at least whether or not they you want to use them or whatever the, that 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 the people are using when they come here to learn to make themselves feel happier and better and more content and more satisfied uh not to use it themselves and have access to that themselves so for that reason i think the guide and we before that also had the had the intention to share these things and also to make it more possible when we do have retreats, or and not just our retreat or my teaching, but other people, that people can join those classes and if anybody were working and then the summer interns can join, then we should create work schedules where it's possible to break away and do that, if people want to, you know. We should try, we always have tried a little bit to do that, but not enough probably because we get too stressed and pressed, right? But Mike, you always talk about that when you introduce and tell programs, you talk about how the staff is into it and so happy that they're here and if they're nice, then, then of course you always do it in the context of getting tips. <laughs> which, that's which the you closing, do. That's the which closing you do. Okay? I know that's the more. But, See, but partially, it, it, the, the more truth there is, the better the amount of tips, I'm sure. You know? Yes. The more there is that attitude, people can feel that attitude. So, you know, in a way, America as a culture, you know, one thing is, is a fact is America as a culture sort of because of our democratic thing and all individuals are equal and this and that, we don't have a very high service culture. Mm -hmm. You know, America doesn't. I mean, people have jobs that do serve others in various ways, but the idea of serving is not a big thing in our culture. We associate it with Europe and a class system, you know, and cast, you know, Downton Abbey upstairs and downstairs, you know, this kind of thing. We associate it with that. And, and we're not suggesting that we should have that here either at all. Of course, we're not imitating Downton Abbey. But, but the idea that there is something to, you know, it's like Shantideva's thing, which I like so much, where Shantideva, and some of you have heard me mention it because I'm always into it when I give a class, but Shantideva in his sort of behavioral self, 
reminding chapter, he says about how in the future, whenever anybody asks me for directions, like where's the conference center or where's whatever, I will never point with one finger, it's over there, he says. I will always in, use my whole hand with all the fingers like when you invite an honored guest to come to your house or something, and I will invite them to go, that person to go somewhere. He said, so it's this tiny little difference of point, okay, go over there, there's the kitchen <laughs> over there, you know, go get your plate over there, versus, oh, it's over there. And it's a subliminal thing, it's a body language thing about that of service, you know, like I'm serving you to go where you want to go, do you know what I mean? So it's little things like that that create the atmosphere, I think, that that makes people happy, you know. And I think everybody does get that feeling here a little bit anyway, but the point is, the more we consciously work on it, the more we will radiate that feeling and the, and the better and the happier we will be and, um, and uh, the better men love will do and the bigger the tips will be. <laughs> That's very good. And the more popular the place will be. So, you know, maybe Shanti Deva, you know, the Dalai Lama himself is very kind of interesting. You know, he's the big, the big cheese Tibet, the Dalai Lama, you know. But he always talks about how Mao Zedong was very kind to him. Not that he doesn't know that Mao Zedong committed the most horrendous atrocities and caused the death of millions of people. He knows that very well. But he feels kind to him because, he, as an enemy, he drove him away from the country. But that liberated the Dalai Lama from being a kind of a prisoner in a golden cage, sort of at a big remove from the people, you know, sort of in this like high place, you know, where he didn't have interaction, he didn't learn from people, he couldn't interact uh, strongly with them because of the sort of nature of the way the culture was. People would have been scared if he interacted with them more, you know, it was like whatever it was. And so he learned a lot not by being with him. And what is very fascinating is he had, of course, considered the highest teachers in all Tibet were his teachers. But one of his teachers said he had to find this one guy whose name was Kunu Lama Rinpoche, his name was, who was an Indian citizen actually from the, the Himalayan foothills, the Himalayan areas of India, uh, culturally Tibetan, but actually an Indian citizen had educated in Indian University and knew some, you know, knew English and German and some other languages. But then had spent 30 years in Tibet going around finding all the best, even the humblest, but the best teachers from all the different traditions. And apparently this one teacher of the Dalai Lama knew that he was one who had a special transmission or lineage of teaching of the Shantideva compassion teaching which is in that book, Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, or The Way of the Bodhisattva, they're different translations, which we also teach a lot here. I was just quoting from that book. And so, but this guy was not in any kind of high Tibetan sort of Lama thing, and he had become a layman, even he wasn't even a monk anymore in India. And he worked as a teacher of Sanskrit poetics in an Indian university by that time, because he knew Sanskrit also well, but, and he was very humble. So, but he said to the Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama's own teacher said, you must study with that guy and get what he knows about Shantideva. He has something very special. He got from a very humble, wandering yogi teacher in Kham, in Eastern Tibet, and which is a unique kind of lineage of the teachings about, sort of a vivid personal lineage. So then the Dalai Lama went to, to the Sanskrit University of Benares to try to meet the guy, and he, was, he went and gave a talk there, and then hoping to meet the guy. But then the guy didn't come to the talk. He was scared, to, too humble to come to the Dalai Lama's talk. So, so he was frustrated, the Dalai Lama. And then he was driving through the street on his way, and you know, sort of like uh, with the policemen, you know, the guard in him and so on, the Indians, you know, police. And then he saw this man walking in the street, and he stopped the, the, the motorcade, and jumped out and went over and started bowing down in the street to this guy. <laughs> and when the guy saw the Dalai Lama coming over and bowing down, he ran away. Because <laughs> again, he was humble and he thought, oh no, Dalai Lama dodged me, I'll get in trouble or something, you know, like some jealousy or some people will do something to me and he ran away. So then Dalai Lama got really more frustrated Then he called, he had his, his, his secretary call the administrator at the Fenton University, found out where he lived and drove over there and went up 
five-story walk up into a room with no furniture where the guy was sitting there on the floor and knocked on the pounded on the door. <laughs> so then the guy said, oh, you know, you can't come in, there's no place to sit. No, he said, it's all right, I'll sit on the floor. And then he received teachings from this guy for months, actually, for some time. And, uh, and, that, and then he is supposed to be, so his teaching about, I don't know how much any of you may have read of the Dalai Lama's writing, but he talks about, he has slogans like he says, my religion is kindness, you know, and uh, he has slogans like that, you know, and compassion is my religion, things like that, not Buddhism or something. And that's where he get that comes from that Shantideva thing. You know, he is the sort of living representative of that tradition, and he has, he has presented that around the world in an amazing way, actually. Not only to heads of state and things, although nowadays the Chinese are trying, making it hard for heads of state. They spank any heads of state who meets with him, like the British Prime Minister met with him, and then they wouldn't meet him, the Chinese wouldn't meet him and give the British any business deals for two years to punish them. So then people are scared to meet, him, meet the Dalai Lama at the moment. Because the Chinese are trying their blackballing technique everywhere. But anyway, he's had a wonderful impact on them. You, know? you can see here that Dan Gu shows a picture of him meeting some school children, I think, in Canada. Typical. You know, and in Japan, and he goes to school and everything like that. So anyway, that's the main thing I wanted to share today. And in the future, maybe we will work through some of Shantideva's ideas mm -hmm. in a more in a systematic way in the context of this force for good. And meantime, also, anybody who's interested, can you online, I, we can make it free online to anybody here. I guess you have the link, right? Yeah, I have the link, Trump. And, uh, you know, online there's a course on the force for good that has been two times happened. Tomorrow, the class is not taught by me. I'm the sort of main person of the course. But tomorrow, a woman named Elizabeth Pijov, well, it's a Russian name, Pijova, she said, is what her, you know, but they dropped the A, uh, who was trained in the, one of the Dalai Lama initiatives at Stanford University by, by his translator, organized by his translator and a, and a heart surgeon who works there, and they have a center for compassion. And they train people to teach compassion in a secular, non-religious way to people. And she teaches an eight-week course at Tibet House and some other ones in New York at Columbia, too, this woman does. Um, and uh, so I asked her to do one class because she herself is a product in a way of one of these initiatives of the Dalai Lama. So anybody who wants to check in uh, at 7 p.m. tomorrow night online, would you make it available somewhere in some media somewhere? on some, um, and then people can sit and look at it, you know, and then they may be able to... What, Miko? Miko, compassion. It doesn't mean... The guy is really feeling his hormones. I can't do anything about it. I know. <laughs> Miko. Yes, Miko, we got it. So, Justin, can you see to it down in, uh, in the cafe, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. There's a... The put up a screen the there, or, the or, or here, or there, wherever, you know. Yeah, but it's not compulsory. It's just anybody who wants to do it. That might be fun for some people. You might enjoy that. And she's just going to, it's like a sampler. She does an eight week thing, which I don't think is going to be online. But uh, it's she doesn't do it online, she does it in person. But, uh, but this is just a one class thing. Does anyone have any questions? And then Sharon Salzberg will do one the following Wednesday, and then I'll be back. I'm just, I'm saying What's that? I'm just saying if anybody has a question. Yeah, any question. Any question. Okay. We always have to have questions at the end of any talk. Any question? Yeah, I got a question. He has a question. Yes. How does speak how do our wages get paid if it's all? Um, I I can't. You have to speak. How do our wages get paid if it's all? Only we are um, not paid. We are the only one not paid one. How does our what? Wages get paid. paid. He's wondering how how their staff get paid. How? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How does Tibet House in Manila fund itself each year? Oh, how's the funding of this place? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we earn money from the people who come here. And um, the the investment in the spa <coughs> building and some of the maintenance came from Tibet House, which receives its funding by donations, by fundraising. Well, you know, fundraising. it's a non-profit. And this is also a non-profit. Mm -hmm. but, but, um, and actually, when the lady wanted to give it to Tibet House, some of the board members of Tibet House were nervous, and they felt maybe it was too big a thing to manage because Tibet House was just this one 
little sort of museum gallery, office place, uh, library, you know, in New York, which is sort of like a cultural embassy for Tibet. People go in there and they sort of think they're, they see Tibet things and they learn about Tibet. That's what Tibet House in New York is. And um, so, um, uh, uh, so they were nervous about taking it, therefore we've been very careful to keep the place in the black by Nina's management, by her, you know, working for free, uh, to keep it in the black so we have enough people coming to be able to pay the salaries of people. Let me explain to you, it's been a very big headache for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and the thing is, so, that so far we've never been in the red, but on the other hand, the Tibet House, we have done special fundraising to build the spa building and to maintain things and to invest in some other modifications on some of the buildings. So in a way, some of the Tibet House board feels that we have... Um, you know, that maybe it's not, it's, we should have maybe just sold it or something, you know, instead of, instead of doing that, but because they, did, they weren't on board uh, necessarily with my view that the way of long-term supporting Tibet House is to make Tibetan culture desirable and known by people by making Tibetan medicine known to help them. And partially I have that view because since I, I was made by my so early Lama in the 60s, came. my Mongolian Lama, to study Tibetan this medicine. Yeah. Although I didn't practice subsequently mm -hmm. myself, I traveled with different Tibetan doctors who have been around in the U.S. for 30, 40, 40 years now, and translated for them in diagnoses of thousands of patients. And I've seen many people helped by the medicine. That's the actual medicine, you know, pills and dietary injunctions and behavioral modifications and things like that. And I've seen a lot of people help. We really can't dish out the pills very easily because it's not, they're not technically approved. That's sort of under the radar when a single guy just travels around and then goes back to India, you know. But I've seen that. I've seen the benefit to many people, and I've been benefited myself by taking Tibetan medicine. So, so I know that that will 